Well, Happy New Year. Did you have a great New Year? But you know what? It's not just Happy New Year. Merry 11th day of the 12 days of Christmas. You're looking at me funny. Some of you thought the 12 days of Christmas led up to Christmas. Raise your hand if that's what you thought. Uh Uh-huh, the rest of you are lying to me. Most people think it's the 12 days leading up and they have 12 day advent calendars leading up to the 25th. Not true. You see, because of different calendars and things, there were people who believe that Jesus was born on the December 25th. We don't know that for sure, but that's a date that was set. Well, they believe that the wise men arrived 12 days later. And so the 12 days of Christmas were from Christmas Day until that day, which is actually tomorrow, January the 6th. So that's on there. But it's also almost Merry Christmas. Say, why is that? Because in the Orthodox churches around the world, they celebrate Christmas on January 6th or 7th. Why is that? Because they follow the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. You're looking at me like, okay, that's fine. In fact, think about this. Because we are so kind of ethnocentric here in America, January 6th or 7th, depending on the country, is a public holiday in Belarus, Egypt, Ethiopia, Georgia, not the state of Georgia, the country, Kazakhstan, Macedonia, Moldova, Montenegro, Serbia, Russia, and the Ukraine. And in Armenia, it's actually tomorrow. So those are other countries celebrating what? The birth of Christ. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And that's why I'm glad Roger wrote that song, by the way, but we shouldn't just celebrate the birth of Christ this time of year. It ought to be year round. We shouldn't just focus on the resurrection of Christ on Easter. It ought to be all year round. Amen? But our lives should be consumed with this. So that's why I wanted to take one more week and look at the Psalms. And this title for today's message is, Come Let Us Worship the King. We've been talking about the King is coming, the King is coming, the King is coming in our study of Psalms. And now I want to say, come let us worship the King. Why? Because he is holy, holy, holy. Think about that. Think about the reality of the holiness of our Lord and Savior. Now, when we look at our Psalms here, we started in Psalm 100, actually, at Thanksgiving. Then we backed up to Psalm 96, 97, and 98. And today, I just couldn't leave 99 as an orphan. So I had to do 99. But you think about this. Psalms 93 through 100 are called the uh, kingly Psalms, the millennial Psalms, the theocratic Psalms, enthronement Psalms, or messianic Psalms. But what they really shout out is, is the fact that God reigns. Do you believe that? Does God truly reign? Does it always look like it? And that's why these Psalms were written. Written to a people, the Jewish people, at a time when perhaps in this particular psalm, when there was no king, or their king had just been deposed, or was very wicked and evil. And in that time when they're looking for the right king, a righteous king, a promised king, that God had said, these psalms were written to remind people, your ultimate king is who? It's, it's God, and ultimately it's the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so that's what these psalms are all about. In uh, Psalm 93, 97, and 99, we have this refrain, the Lord reigns. They start with that. Psalm 96, verse 10 says, that statement that the Lord reigns is the responsibility of believers to communicate to the whole world. Every nation needs to understand that Yahweh, the particular God of the Jewish people, he reigns, he rules, he is the sovereign. There is none other. And I want you to understand as you think through the Psalms, because there are five books of Psalms. Psalm 1 through 41 is book 1. You have 42 through, I think it's 72 is book 2. 73 through 89 is book 3. 90 through 106 is book 4. 107 through 150 is book 5. They, they align themselves well as they were put together with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the, that was the structure of the Psalms when they compiled them. And when you think about the Psalms, you think about the promises that God had made to the people that they were looking for. And you think about Psalm 1 is the opening of the Psalms, and then Psalm 2 dives right in, and Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. At the beginning and the ending of most of the books of the, of the Psalms are messianic emphases. So at the beginning of Psalms, you have the book of Psalm, verse 2, you have, or Psalm 2, you have this commencement of the Psalter with the proclamation that God's Son is going to reign and he is going to come and judge the defiant nations. So repent and run to him quickly. 
Well, then you move on to book two, and you have the idea at the end of book two, Psalm 72 concludes with the reign of the righteous king. Psalm, the book three, though, it does something interesting. In Psalm 73, Psalm 74, and Psalm 88, the believers are wrestling with a problem. They have God's covenant promise of the Davidic covenant, that there would be a child of David, an offspring, a descendant of David that would rule on the throne eternally. There was going to be this ongoing righteous king that was promised to them, but that wasn't their experience. As they looked at their nation, they weren't seeing that. They were struggling with that. And so book three, which is reminiscent of Genesis, Exodus, what's the third one? Leviticus, where this righteousness was presented, the holiness of God was presented, the worship of God was presented, and they're not seeing that. They're seeing a nation that's rebelling against God. They're seeing kings that are unholy. They're not following the word. And so they're crying out, God, have you failed to keep your promise? Now, anybody here ever felt like God wasn't listening to you? You ever felt like this nation's going down the toilet and God doesn't care? A lot of people feel this way. They're looking at life and they're experiencing challenges and difficulties and they're frustrated with what God seemingly is not doing. There's a difference between promise and reality. And so book four answers that. In fact, the end of book three, at the end of Psalm 89, I think it's verses uh, 30, uh, what is it? Psalm 89, verses 38 through 51, there's a lament that the Davidic covenant does not seem to be fulfilled. And book four answers that. And these Psalms focus on the fact that in reality, these human kings are not your answer. God is king. Always has been, is now, always will be. In fact, uh, Dr. Barrick at, at the Master's Seminary referred to this when he said this. First of all, the Lord was king long before there was any royal dynasty in Israel. He was the creator king. Then he says, the Lord is king even now. One of the main themes of Psalms 93 through 100. He is still sovereign and in control in spite of what it might look like with the collapse of the Davidic dynasty. And the Lord will be king in a new advent and theophany in the future when he comes to judge the world to establish the messianic kingdom for 1,000 years. To the Jewish people, these Psalms were saying, look, God is your king. He was in the past before there was a king, before there was a David. He is now, even though it looks like the nation's having struggles, and he will be in the future when the true promised fulfillment of the Davidic covenant comes. And when that one comes, perfect righteousness will be here. Wow, what a great truth, isn't that? You say, well, Paul, how does that practically apply? I mean, I, I'm making my New Year's resolutions, and I'm trying to think through what I ought to be doing. Well, let's get practical with this. Anybody here make any New Year's resolutions? You don't have to tell me what they are, but any of you make any? Okay, this, this practice goes all the way back to the Babylonians, by the way. This is an ongoing practice people have done each year to evaluate their lives, look and see, is there something I could be doing better? How could I improve my life? How can I make this year better than last? How many of your resolutions were about God? How many of your resolutions were about your relationship with him? About spending time with him? About worshiping him more faithfully? About praying to him more disciplined? How many of your resolutions were about being in the word? Or how about this one? About God increasing in your life? that it would be about him and not about you? How many of you resolve to submit to him fully and to obey him explicitly? God, this year is gonna be the year that I'm gonna grow in radical obedience, no matter what the cost. How many resolutions were about being a better testimony, being a bolder witness for Christ, reaching more people with the gospel? Or about exalting him as King of kings and Lord of lords, or about prioritizing your life around what he commanded you to do, which is make disciples. See, that's what this psalm's gonna call us to. It's a powerful, powerful psalm. And so I wanna show it to you in two ways. I wanna first have you see it on the PowerPoint slide here, what it looks like without any markings on it. This is just the psalm. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. And then it says what? 
Holy is he. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Why? Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, and yet an avenger of their evil deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. Why? For holy is the Lord our God. Notice that three times. Holy, holy, holy. You get the theme for this whole psalm right there. But now as you look at that, I want to show it to you in a different way. And this is the way it helps me when I study the Bible. I try to look at what applies to who. And so on this one, I put it, I don't know if the colors are coming through clearly, and I'm colorblind anyway. So anyway, theoretically, yellow is God and who God is and what he does. Blue is us as his people, and red is our motivation. So if you look at that, it's kind of more, looks more like gold to me than yellow. But anyway, you see up there, what do we learn about God? The Lord reigns, he is enthroned, he is exalted. He has a great and awesome name. He loves justice, he has established equity, he's executed justice and righteousness. Go down further, he answered them. He answered them, he is forgiving, yet he's an avenger. You see those things about God? And then you see, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to tremble and shake. We're supposed to praise him. We are supposed to exalt him and worship at his footstool. And who was involved in that? Moses, Aaron, and Samuel were our examples, living illustrations. They called upon the Lord. They kept his testimonies and statutes. They exalt the Lord. They worship at his holy hill. And then the red part is why? And there's a motivation. Holy, holy, holy is he. Does that help you see the psalm a little bit differently? I encourage you as you study your Bible to do things like that. Look for the different elements, circle things, underline things, use different color pens and pencils, and it just helps you see what the psalm is really all about. Now, one observation I wanna make is that there are triplets characteristic of this psalm. Three times he uses the word exalt in verse two, five, and nine. Three times he said he is holy, verse three, five, and nine. Does that remind you of any other passage of scripture? Isaiah six, when Isaiah the prophet goes and he has this vision and all of a sudden he sees God high and exalted and on his throne in the temple and the temple's filling with smoke and he hears these angels flying, covering their eyes, covering their feet as they fly, six winged angels flying and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's a reminder of that. What that did was the same thing as happening here in this psalm. It's a profound reminder. By the way, the only attribute of God repeated three times in the Bible is holy. It doesn't say God loves, love, love, just, 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 forgiving, 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 but it does say holy, holy, holy. Why do you do that? For emphasis. It's my concern that the holiness of God is not a high enough priority in the church today or in our personal lives. It appears to me, and I, I can be wrong, I was wrong once, <laughs> maybe more. It appears to me what most people want is a genie in a bottle. They want a God they can control they want a God that they can tell what is right and wrong. They want a God that just loves, but he's not necessarily holy. We have churches full of people that are unrepentant. They don't confess sin. There is no grieving over sin. There is no genuine sorrow and turning from sin, but they still come and they think they're okay with God. And the psalmist wants to make it clear, this God is king. He rules absolutely, and he's perfectly holy. And if you're going to be his and follow him and worship him, you really ought to be like him, pursuing him with all that you have. So God is holy. But there's another element that comes up three times. He's personal. In verse 5, verse 8, and verse 9, it says, Our God. 
This is not just any God. This is not just some generic being out there. This is not just some tribal deity. This is the God of the universe, the one and only, and we personally know him as God. And he wants it that way. He wants this to be personal for you. He wants you to start 2020 having a relationship directly with him that changes everything about your life. He wants you to know him personally. So as we wrap up our series on Christmas messages, focusing on the second coming of Christ, I want to return our attention to the coming King. I want you to focus with me on what we should know about him, what our response ought to be to that, and our motivation for that response. So we're going to look at all three of these things. Number one, God is holy in his sovereignty. Verses 1 through 3, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. Well, in there, what should we know about God? There's a bunch of things here we should know about God. Number one, he is Lord. You notice that's in all capital letters. In most uh, modern translations, when that's the case, it's the name for God, which is what? Yahweh. Yahweh. Now, some people have kind of messed that up over the year and made that into Jehovah. That's not even a legitimate word. Yahweh would be closer to the actual Hebrew word. Why is that important? Because if you go back to book three of the Psalms and they're wrestling through, has God failed to keep the Davidic covenant? And he starts off, and you'll see it over and over and over through this passage, the Lord Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. What is that? the covenant-keeping faithful God. So the psalmist shouts out to them, the Lord, the faithful one, the one who has never, ever lied, the one who has always kept every promise, that's the God we're talking about. That's the God we trust in. And he reigns. He is Lord. Do you know that he's never failed to keep a promise, ever? Do you understand that? Is he going to start with you? No. No. He will keep all of his promises to everybody throughout all eternity. Notice also that he's not just Lord, but he reigns. He is absolutely sovereign at all times, even when it doesn't look or feel like it. He reigns, ongoing, past, present, future. We can bank our lives on that. i got to tell you something. The sovereignty of God is the greatest comfort in my life. Yes, I'm rejoicing that he loves me, but if he loved me and wasn't sovereign, that wouldn't get me very far. The fact of the matter is my God is in control of all things at all times. Does that comfort you? It just enables me to face things. We're going to get to the book of James, God willing, starting next week. And we're going to jump right in and we're going to see starting in verses 2 and following. We need to understand that God is sovereign when we encounter various trials. If you don't believe God is sovereign, you're not going to be able to obey what he says in, in chapter one. There's so many truths that tie into the sovereignty of God and knowing that that is true and that it was symbolized in the Ark of the Covenant. So by this time, the Ark has been brought in and more than likely, and if this was written earlier, we wouldn't have a date on this, but if it was written earlier, the Ark would have been brought into the tabernacle. If it's later, it's in the temple. You've got this Ark of the Covenant. And this is, it says that he is enthroned above the cherubim. Well, that's a, certainly a picture of the Ark. The Ark is a box. What's inside the box? Reminders of God's holiness and man's sinfulness. You have the Ten Commandments, which we break constantly. You had the rod of Aaron that had to be in there because people rebelled against God's appointed authority. And you have manna that God provided faithfully. What did they do about it? They complained. Oh man, but manna bread again? Are you serious? They're just nothing but whining and complaining, rebelling against God's holy, perfect provision. And this is the nature of man, and God is perfect. So you've got this box, symbolic of God's holiness and man's sinfulness, and on the top of the box is the mercy seat. And that covering on the box called the mercy seat, or the place of propitiation, would then be once a year, the high priest would go in and sprinkle what on it? Blood, a perfect sacrifice of a sinless animal. And that blood would cover and above that were two angels, carved angels, looking down at the top of the box in awe. Because God's glory was hovering above that box. How can God's glory hover around sinful man? 
only through the shed blood of the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that we'll celebrate soon. The angels are blown away. They don't understand grace. Grace wasn't offered to angels. And they look down and they see this. And God is enthroned above all of that. He rules from Jerusalem. It says, the Lord is great in Zion. Jeremiah 3 prophesies the Lord will bring all the tribes of Israel back together someday, and he will rule over them in Israel. Some Jesus day, Jesus will return. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. It will split from east to west. He will then wipe out all of his enemies, and he will sit on a throne in a new temple in a whole new Jerusalem with dramatically changed geography and topography, and he will rule and reign in Israel. But his rule doesn't stop there because it then says he is exalted above all the peoples. His sovereignty is universal. He will sit on the throne in Jerusalem, but he's not a local deity. He is the God that must be worshiped by all people everywhere. They're commanded to rightly respond to him. So what is our response to our sovereign God? Listen very carefully what Charles Spurgeon said. I put this quote on the back in your, in your discussion questions. Opposition to divine sovereignty is essentially atheism. Let's let that sink in for a moment. Opposition to divine sovereignty is atheism. For people who say, I believe in God, but I will not do what he says, they are in reality an atheist. So no, no, they believe in God. No, they believe in something that is not God. So you either believe in God or you worship idols. Either way, it's not truly God. You are not truly a theist. You might say you are, but there is no practical definition that matches that in your life. He goes on to say, Men have no objection to a God who is really no God, a God who shall be the subject of caprice, who shall be a servile follower of their will, who shall be under their control, but a God who speaks and it is done, who commands and it stands fast, a God who does as he will among the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of this lower world, such a God as this they cannot endure. And yet, is it not essential to the very being of God that he should be absolute and supreme? Certainly to the scriptural conception of God, sovereignty is an absolute necessity. God, by very definition, must be sovereign. And if he's not Lord of your life, then you don't know him. That's the reality of this. And could you imagine the Israelites reading that? But wait a minute, we're the offspring of Abraham. Isn't that what they said to Jesus? No, you are the children of who? The devil. And your works make it evident. Wow. Wow. How should we respond to our sovereign God? Well, it says in our text here, we should tremble and shake. Verse 1, let the peoples tremble. Now, Psalm 96, 9 says it similarly, let all the earth. To tremble is to be moved and disturbed, even thrown into commotion. Trembling is when it's just like, I, I, I'm so blown away, I just, I'm not sure what to do. I'm just absolutely in shock and awe. There's such reverential awe toward this sovereign who is absolutely in control of all things. And I realize I have not been submitting to him. I fall down and tremble. And it says, let the earth shake. This is a Hebrew word that refers to seismic activity. Are you familiar with that in Southern California? Seismic activity. Now, when, when the earth was shaking during the Northridge quake, did any of you feel like you were absolutely in control? No, there is something about really seeing God, the real God, the God of the Bible, not some God of our fantasy, the real God in all of his awe and wonder and power and sovereignty that just causes you to just shake. There's a reverence, there's a fear, there's a rightful response. Why? Because that sovereign one is perfectly holy. It'd be one thing if he was sovereign and wicked and he allowed me to be wicked too but he's not. He's sovereign and holy, and he calls people to holiness. See, what causes me to tremble before a holy God is my sinfulness, my inadequacies, my failures, my lack of following through on commitments that I've made. I know I deserve punishment. Think about this. Any of you who have been raising kids, have, have your kids ever been like caught 
red-handed and doing something they shouldn't, and they know they're caught and there's no way to explain it. Do you ever notice what happens to their lip? A little quiver starts going on. Well, what happens to their lip ought to be happening to our entire being if we rightly understand and respond to God. He is so holy. He is so powerful, so sovereign. But secondly, in the midst of that, we also ought to praise let them praise your great and awesome name. Verse 3 and 6 both refer to God's name, and the name refers to the person. You say, how do you know that? Well, it's not just hearing the name Yahweh. It's understanding what represented by that. Think about this for a moment. You might know someone named Bill, and you hear their name, and you go, Bill, not Bill. No, 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 not that Bill, that Bill. Oh, Bill. Have you noticed that? Is it the name? No, it's the person. And that's the reality. Who is this person? Who is Yahweh? What do you know to be true about him? If you really know him, you'll praise him. You'll lift him up. You'll exalt him. You'll honor him. Because he's great and awesome. He is matchless in all the universe. So we tremble, we shake, and we praise. Why? Why should we respond this way to our sovereign God? Simply, holy is he. What is holy? Set apart, distinct, separated, willing to be totally different than. God is absolutely other. He is so far beyond us, there's an infinite gap between. His morality is infinitely perfect. Everything about his being is perfect. He is above and beyond us in every way imaginable. And he is distinctly higher than all in his moral perfection. His justice is holy justice. His wisdom is holy wisdom. His power is holy power. His truth is holy promises. He is holy and true. His name signifies all of that by saying he's holy. And that's the way he rules. If you get a glimpse of that, even a small bit, not a God who allows you to do whatever you want to do behind closed doors. Not the God who says, ah, whatever you're doing on the computer when nobody else is watching, that's no big deal. Not the God who says, you know, your business dealings, the end justifies the means. No, not that God. That God doesn't exist. You get a glimpse of the true God, the living God, the holy God, the only response the right response is reverence, looking at my own life, making sure I'm becoming like the one that I worship. That's what ought to be our response. God is holy in his sovereignty. Secondly, he's holy in his justice. It says the strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. What should we know about our just God? Number one, he is personally involved in justice. God is personally involved in justice. He says you two times. You have established equity. You have executed justice. Both occurrences, that pronoun is used in the emphatic position in the Hebrew text. You yourself, you alone. God and God alone can bring about perfect justice in this world. Have we tried? Were you perfect in the way you justly raised your children? Not if I ask them, right? No, we're not. We don't understand. We can't see. We don't know at all. And, and sometimes our motivation is not right. Sometimes we just want peace and quiet, and we don't execute justice perfectly. But God does. He personally engages all of his being into justice. He is powerfully involved in justice. Now, verse 4 is one of the most difficult verses in all of the Old Testament to translate. And if you read through six different uh, translations, you'll get six different translations. Because it's challenging to get the word order and figure it out. Nobody disagrees on what it means. They just disagree on how to phrase it in English. Here's what it means. The king, the Lord himself, has power and uses it in order to bring justice, which he loves. God loves justice. Why? Because he's holy. He loves justice. 
He's powerfully involved in justice. The omnipotence of God someday is going to engage in justice. He will make it right. You know what? That's why I'm okay when if I get wronged in this present world. Someday it's going to be made right. Amen? I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to go out and get my pound of flesh. I don't have to go out and get revenge. I can just relax and let God do what God wants to do in his perfect timing, right? You with me on this or no? I'm telling you, if you live this way, you're going to have a much more relaxed 2020. You are going to thoroughly be at peace, enjoying his powerful justice. He is precise in his judgments. The word justice used here means to determine what is right, assigning rewards and punishments. God in the right time is going to give rewards to those who are doing what's right and punishment to those who've done what's wrong. The word equity means fair, free of discrimination. He can't be bribed or manipulated. And righteousness means he adheres to a standard. The moral standard God has said will be the final standard. You either match up to it or you don't. Question, how many of us match up to God's perfect moral law? None of us. How do we get there then? By trusting in the one who does. Amen? By having a substitute who makes it possible for God to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in the perfect one. Wow. He's personally involved. He's powerfully involved. He's precise in his judgments. Now, this is the reason why the ungodly kings were removed from Jacob or Israel. They, they were going to be replaced by the righteous kings. So this could bring also in comfort and encouragement to the Jewish people. How should we respond to our just God? Exalt him. I love this. What does the word exalt mean? Lift up. Put him higher in rank. Now question, think about this for a moment. Can you actually lift God up? No, he's already high, right? He is the highest. He is the utmost. You can't lift him up practically, but you can lift him up personally in your own life. That's the joy of worship. When we come together and worship and we make that point to be here together, we lift God up where he belongs in our own life. We exalt him. He is the highest rank. He's elevated to the place he deserves. His justice was accomplished in his mercy through the sacrifice of his son. And I lift him up where he belongs as my only hope for salvation. I praise and exalt him for who he is and what he's done. Then secondly, I submit fully to him. Notice it says worship at his what? His footstool. Now it's interesting that the Ark of the Covenant was actually called the footstool of God. So imagine if God is sitting on his throne... And he has a footstool, so if, I, if, if, laugh at me for a moment, if I were God, and I'm sitting on my throne, and this is my footstool, where should the worshiper be? Where, where in relationship to my feet? Below my feet. You get the picture that God was trying to get to us here through the psalm? Genuine worship exalts God and bows down the person. That's worship. I get low. I come down underneath. What does that mean in practicality? I surrender. I submit. I acknowledge for all to see. I have no right to run my life. I have no right to determine what is right or wrong. I submit to you. That's genuine worship. For those who worship him in spirit and in truth. They bow down. They come down below, submitting to him fully as the one who has the right to tell me what to do. Why should I respond to him this way? Why should I exalt him and submit fully to him? Because he's holy. He's holy. He's a just judge. And someday I will stand before him, and so will you. Question. Would you like to bow down now or defiant now and be forced to bow down later? Oh, to choose to bow down to a worthy judge who deserves our worship and our humble submission. That's what this psalm is calling them to, to truly respond to God as the Holy One who deserves to be loved and followed and served this way. Well, that leads us to our third part, God is holy in his sovereignty and holy in injustice. He's holy in his forgiveness. 
Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them, and yet an avenger of their evil deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for holy is the Lord our God. What do we need to know about our God? Number one, he answers prayer. Amen? God answers prayer. He really does answer prayer. He answers personally. Look at verse 6. Emphatic. He answered. Who? This awesome holy God, this sovereign judge, this perfect being personally answers your prayers. They came to him, they prayed to him, and he answered. He spoke. You answered. Three times again. They prayed and it says three times, he answered, spoke, answered. This is the God that we love and serve. Then he forgives sin, verse 8. We'll talk about that more in a second. And he avenges evil deeds. That's what we need to know about God. We can come to him as his children and he will hear us and answer us. We can come to him in our sin and we can confess and he will forgive us. But if you defy him, he will avenge. How do I respond to a forgiving God like that? I call on him, like Moses, Aaron, and Samuel did. See, he picks those three people for a very specific reason. Moses and Aaron were engaged in the wilderness wanderings, and so as this matches with Deuteronomy, or Numbers, it would make sense. They cried out to God, they interceded on behalf of the nation. Why did the nation need that? Because the nation was what? Sinful and rebellious. It was a nation that turned its back on God. And they had to cry out. Moses, at one point, God says, hey, Moses, just get out of the way, and I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'll start a new nation with you. And Moses says, Lord, don't do that. Don't do that. For your name, for your glory, preserve them. Forgive them, Lord. And he did. Aaron did the same thing. He interceded on behalf of the people. Samuel interceded to such a degree that at one point in 1 Samuel chapter 12, the people of Israel came to him as their priest, and they came and said, Samuel, Samuel, please pray for us. You know what his response was for Samuel 12, 23? Far be it from me that I would sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Wow. He saw it as his divine mandate and responsibility to intercede on behalf of the people. Incredible. Call on him. Call on his name, Yahweh. Talk to the one who keeps his promises. Talk to the one who is self-sufficient, the one who is eternal, the one who needs no one else, the one who can meet all of your needs. Talk to him. But what comfort to the readers that would be. God was faithful to Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. He'll be faithful to us. He hasn't abandoned the Davidic covenant. He'll put his king on the throne. We can count on that. We just need to call up on him. And then we need to obey his word. It says they, those three, kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. And so should we. Let me ask you a question. Did, did Moses do that perfectly? Did David do that perfectly? Did Aaron do that perfectly? Did Samuel do that perfectly? Now, we have Moses striking the rock twice when he was supposed to speak at it, getting angry and frustrated all the time. we got Aaron, who's involved in making the golden calf. We've got Samuel, whose whole household was a mess, and when his kids were all screwed up, he wasn't even willing to go confront them the right way. No, no, these were sinners. But the general direction of their life was obedience, and when they sinned, they repented. So we call on him, we obey his word, and we repent of any known sin. You are a forgiving God to them. Scholars debate, does them refer to those three guys or the nation of Israel? I think it primarily refers to those three guys. That God forgave them. He's the God of second chances. He can forgive you too, right? What a blessing. But fourthly, they exalted and worshiped him. Exalt is the same word that's been used before. That's used three times in this text. Lift him up. Worship literally means to bow down. I can't help but think of John 3.30. He must increase, but I must, I must decrease. You know what my goal for 2020 is? For me? That I'm out of the picture. I would love to get through 2020, and it would never be about me. It would always be about him. That's a lifestyle of worship. 
Any of you here struggle with it being about you? Your word, world just kind of gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh, the joy of having it be about him, the one who deserves it. Wow, how exciting that would be. Why should I respond that way? To a forgiving God? For the Lord our God is holy. Our God. The God that we worship here at the British Bible Fellowship, he's perfectly holy. He's set apart. He's distinct. He's separate. And he says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let me ask you a question. Are you set apart in the Jesus Christ? Are you a pure, holy vessel for him to use? Have you committed your life to say, Jesus Christ, my holy and righteous sovereign king, my holy, righteous judge, my holy, righteous high priest, I come before you and I submit. I want to be holy like you're holy. Please, Lord, make me like you. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming back soon. He will rule and reign. He promised it and it will happen. Amen? Our Lord is sovereign, just, and forgiving. So while we wait for his return, we should come before him with fear and reverence, exalting him, bowing down to him, submitting to him, praying to him, obeying him, seeking his forgiveness, praising his holy name for all he has done, is doing, and will do through our sovereign king, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's my vision for 2020? Number one. Let's see God for who he truly is. Let's see God. Perhaps your God is too small. He's not the God of the Bible. Get in this book. Study about him. Pick up a good theology. Study God himself. It is the most liberating thing you'll ever know. Jesus said, this is eternal life that they may know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You, knowing God, knowing who he is, knowing about him, having your mind blown by him, read the Bible, look for God, ask him to reveal himself to you in a more thorough way. Spend time alone with him this year. Spend time together in corporate worship. Let's lift each other up to know God. Secondly, see yourself properly. Acknowledge your place in God's kingdom. You are the servant. You are his slave. You are his ambassador. See that. Bow down before him. Submit to him as rightful Lord and, and Savior. Decrease so he can increase. And see yourself as someone who needs his grace every single day. And thirdly, see clearly that Jesus is returning soon as holy judge. When he comes back, are you ready? I don't know all of your hearts. I don't know where you stand with Jesus Christ today. But I want you to be prayerfully saying, Lord, am I ready? Do I really know you through Jesus Christ? Am I truly a born-again follower of yours? If so, rejoice and praise him and go out and live for his glory. But if you're not, you certainly can become so right now. You could come to him, embrace him, submit to him, receive his grace and forgiveness only through Jesus. And then make sure others are ready. Oh, what joy it would be if by the end of 2020, each of us had led one other person to Christ. Wouldn't that be exciting? One other person that we had led to Christ and began to disciple them to grow into maturity. Do you think that God wants you to do that this year? Does he want you to witness? And does he want you to take brand new believers and help them grow? This is his mandate. The rightful sovereign king who's returning back says that's what we need to be focused on until he returns. So, Lord, we come before you with gratitude for this psalm. A reminder that even in a world like this where the political battles are raging in America and around the world and wars and rumors of wars and problems and struggles, and it doesn't always appear that you're on the throne. There's all kinds of problems in people's personal lives and health issues and finances and relationships. And sometimes we wonder if you're there, but this psalm shouts out to us, you are. You are the absolute sovereign one and you rule all things at all times and your son is coming back. And we know that someday he'll be here. And so Lord, we wanna live for his kingdom. Enable us in 2020 to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added to us as you deem necessary. Lord, forgive us if we have been self-absorbed. Forgive us if we've been living for this world May today be a time of great repentance and renewal and cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen.
to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Pastor Steve often says, if you feel like you're far from God, he's not the one who's moved. Come back, surrender to him, give him his rightful place as the Lord reigns. Could you do that today? Let's make 2020 a great year where the Lord reigns moment by moment, day by day, all year long in our lives and in our church.